welcome to the renowned Dr. Hawkins. Thank you, Dr. Raj. This is a very kind uh, introduction, and this is a, a great second day here in Louisville. I gave a talk last night, as you alluded to, and uh, so where I talked about COG, um, but today I'm going to talk about um, what I did before I became the chair of the Children's College Group, uh, work in uh, pediatric rectal sarcoma. And as I was sharing these slides, I realized I had an error. I'm still stuck in 2020, so I apologize for the wrong date on my uh, introductory slide. These are my disclosures we've seen before. Today, I want to focus on several areas uh, to review progress in rhabdomyosarcoma. I want to talk about how we use clinical and molecular features to guide the risk-adapted treatment for children with rhabdomyosarcoma. I want to talk about some of the standard chemotherapy approaches that are used to treat rhabdomyosarcoma. And then I also want to talk about some of the issues and strategies that we use in identifying novel agents to incorporate into the treatment of children in clinical trials. This is the general outline of my talk. I'm going to give you an overall history of how trials have evolved uh, in North America. I want to talk about uh, how treatment stratification has been uh, has evolved over time. And then I want to talk about specific clinical trials, focusing on uh, trials that are designed for children at low, intermediate, and high risk for recurrence. And then end with some discussion about the potential to use molecularly matched therapy in treatment. This shows you the, uh, the timeline for clinical trials in North America for children with rhabdomyosarcoma, starting with the IRS or Intergroup Rhabdomyosarcoma Study, uh, which was funded by the NCI in the early 70s. There were a series of clinical trials, IRS 1, 2, 3, and 4, which were designed to uh, improve the outcome for children with either localized or metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma. With the formation of the Children's Oncology Group in 2000, uh, the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee of the COG continued the work of the IRSG with, with studies that were uh, uh, deployed in 2000 and, up and continuing into today. Now, over time, uh, we saw an improvement in the outcome for children with rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. I'm showing you data from those first four IRS studies conducted in the 70s up until the late 1990s. And you can see with each successive study generation, IRS 1, 2, 3, and 4, there was an improvement in overall survival for children with rhabdomyosarcoma. Now, during that time, there were multiple randomized studies conducted, and none of the randomized studies actually had a winning arm. But each successive generation of studies had improved outcome. This likely improved uh, supportive care, uh, general increase in intensity of treatment, as well as uh, refinements in surgery, radiation oncology, and imaging. During that time, we also recognized that rhabdomyosarcoma was not a single disease of children with uh, this, this soft tissue tumor, but rather uh, multiple different diseases. And you could uh, uh, divide the children with rhabdomyosarcoma into different risk groups. That is, risk for recurrence. A low risk group uh, shown in the, the uh, uh, pink orange at the top, a uh, line at the top, a group at intermediate risk for recurrence. That's the dotted blue line, which is about half of all patients. And those at highest risk for recurrence, that's the lower line in green, those who present with metastatic disease. And you can see that these populations have very distinct outcomes, both in event-free survival and overall survival. And this is very helpful because it allowed us to design studies where we uh, uh, modulated the intensity of treatment based on the risk of recurrence. Um, until a few years ago, this is the risk stratification that was used. And the details are really not important, but we used clinical features about where the tumor arose, how completely it was resected, how large the tumor was, and whether there were distant metastases to uh, identify a risk of either low, intermediate, or high risk. But I want to focus on uh, one feature, which was uh, the use of histology, the type of, of rhabdomyosarcoma. There are two major types of rhabdomyosarcoma. In Brinal, that's the more common type and alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, that is less common. And up until um, the last few years, we've used histology uh, as part of our risk stratification. But we've known for many years that there was some underlying bi biology behind histology. Uh, most patients with alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma have one of two uh, translocations, either involving chromosome 2, or chromosome 1, and, and chromosome 13, generating a PAX3 or a PAX7, PAX01 fusion. And the majority of uh, patients have the, the more common PAX3 fusion, the a minority have the PAX7, but about 20% of children will have a morphologically alveolar tumor but lack a fusion. And what we learned in the course of COG clinical trials was that the outcome was driven not by the histology of the tumor, but by the presence of a FOXA1 fusion. 
this looks at a, a single clinical trial conducted by the Children's Oncology Group and looked at patients who all received uniform therapy. And we can see that the outcome for children with alveolar or with, with uh, rapamycin sarcoma differed based on whether they either had a PAX3 or a PAX7 fusion with the lower outcome shown there, or had either embryonal histology, which lacks a FOX1 fusion, or an alveolar tumor, which lacked a FOX1 fusion, the two curves on the, on the upper part. So what you can see is that the fusion status is the primary driver of outcome, and therefore, uh, we should use FOX1 fusion status rather than histology for risk stratification. And this has subsequently been incorporated into the current COG risk stratification system, where instead of uh, 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 histology, we now use FOX1 fusion status. And I'll go over this table in a little bit more detail in the future to talk about current clinical trials. Now, there still is potential for further risk uh, refinement. And through an effort uh, uh, several years ago, we took all of the data from the last 20 years of clinical trials and added in the feature of FOXA1 fusion status and used a, a, um, uh, an agnostic way of trying to identify clinical features that could be associated with that outcome. And with this data set of uh, nearly 2,000 patients, we could identify that the most important prognostic factor uh, was the presence of metastatic disease. In, th in this analysis, we go through a recursive partitioning to identify factors most associated with outcome until we identify a, a, a terminal leaves in this, in this tree that don't, uh, for which we can't further refine outcome. So once you get beyond metastatic status, the next most important factor in patients with localized disease is the presence or absence of a FOX1 fusion. You can see this, this uh, leaf here. Even within patients with metastatic disease, the most important prognostic factor is the presence or absence of a FOX1 fusion. Then we can do further refinement based on other clinical features, including the age of patients, um, completeness of resection, et cetera. So it's possible that we can uh, add in additional features for risk stratification. Now, at the same time that COG in North America was conducting uh, our studies and using this risk stratification system, a new group had formed in Europe called the European Pediatric Soft Tissue Sarcoma Group, or EPSSG. This is the combination of most of the major countries in Europe, and they led a, a large clinical trial in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma that was asking somewhat different questions. But you'll note that even though they were treating the same disease, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, they had a different risk stratification system. They used different terminology than was used in North America. In fact, they used terms that um, they called high-risk patients, a group of uh, patients with localized disease with higher risk features. This is a group that we would have called intermediate risk. And so even though we were treating the same disease, we weren't speaking the same language. And this made it very difficult for us to compare results uh, across uh, the world between North America and Europe if we didn't come to a common language of how to compare results. So several years ago, I started a process to try to bring together um, the different groups in North America and in Europe and have us come to a common language and a shared data set so that we could compare our results and draw conclusions between very large data sets generated in Europe and in North America. This group, uh, this collaborative group is called Instruct. Um, it's taken a long time to bring the group together. We had to have a series of meetings in some wonderful cities in Europe. Um, but through this process, we were able to reach agreement about how we share data now of over 6,000 patients, soon to be over 8,000 patients with a rare pediatric tumor, and uh, to compare the different strategies used in North America and Europe. And I think this has been a, a, a great example of how collaboration, even across international boundaries, can lead to improvements in outcome just by simple things like data sharing. So now I'm going to focus on um, the recent, uh, current, and planned studies within the Children's Oncology Group for rhabdomyosarcoma. I'll start with uh, children at low risk for recurrence. Now I'm going to use the terminology we used at the time in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, which did not include FOX1 fusion status, because that's how the studies were designed during that era. The low risk patients uh, are approximately a third of all children with rhabdomyosarcoma. They're all have the more favorable histology type in rhinal or COX-1 fusion negative, and they occur at favorable sites or were completely resected at diagnosis. So during this time, COG conducted a study with two different arms. One was for patients with, at low risk um, and at, at most favorable. This was called subset one. These were predominantly children with orbital primary tumors or peritesticular primary tumors. 
And for this study, we asked a single arm question whether we could reduce the duration of treatment. Historically, these children had received 42 weeks of therapy and also give a very modest dose of cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is an alkalinity agent. Its major long-term side effect is infertility. And we hope to use a dose that might be below the uh, risk of infertility for males, uh, less than five grams per meter squared. So in this study, if children had these low risk features, they were enrolled and they received just four courses of BAC, that was the common chemotherapy that included cyclophosphamide and four courses of chemotherapy with vincristine and actinomycin without cyclophosphamide. So again, a modest dose of cyclophosphamide. And the results of the study were clear. Um, we enrolled nearly 300 patients and their failure-free survival was nearly 90%. Their overall survival was nearly 100%. And so we concluded that this modest amount of cyclophosphamide, this short duration of therapy was effective for a well-defined low-risk group of patients. The study also included a second arm, and this was subset two. This is predominantly children who had female GU primary sites, but also included superficial head and neck and biliary primary sites. Again, only embryonal histology or FOXO1 fusion negative. Uh, for this study, for this group of patients, we historically had given very high cumulative doses of cyclophosphamide in excess of 20 grams per meter squared. And so we asked the question, could we give a short duration or a, a, a prolonged duration of therapy, but maintain this sh uh, modest exposure of cyclophosphamide less than five grams per meter squared? So this is the design of this study. Patients received four courses of BAC and then received 12 more courses of VA uh, therapy. Um, and this, this uh, study had somewhat different results. When we compared our event-free survival, it appeared to be inferior to a prior study where we gave a very high cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide, that's D9602. So event-free survival uh, was lower than historic, although overall survival was very similar to historic. So we had a higher risk of recurrences, but most children, if they recurred, could be treated with second-line therapy and still be cured of their cancer. So our conclusion from this study was that for this group of patients, this modest dose of cyclophosphamide was inadequate, that we could not get away with uh, reducing therapy as dramatically as we had planned. And in fact, we needed to consider them more like intermediate risk patients. So now this is the revised risk stratification that's currently in use within the children's oncology group. And you'll see that the patients who previously were called low risk subset two are now included in the intermediate risk. These are the patients with uh, unresected favorable site tumors uh, predominantly, and they're now eligible for our intermediate risk study. I'll now turn to our strategy for these intermediate risk patients. This is about half of all patients with uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. They include all patients who have alveolar histology that's not metastatic. Again, this is FOX1 fusion positive disease in our current way of looking at it and tumors that are um, non-metastatic but are not completely resected at diagnosis and have embryonal histology. So again, half of all the patients, their outcome is somewhere intermediate between low and high-risk patients. For these uh, patients, we asked a simple two-arm randomized question. This is a study that I was the study chair for, um, where we compared the standard chemotherapy back in christening actinomycin and cyclophosphamide versus vincristine actinomycin cyclophosphamide alternating with VI or vincristine and arenatecam. We had preclinical data showing and clinical data showing that arenatecam was a very active drug in the treatment of rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So we thought that this was the right place to test this in a randomized setting. All patients received early radiation after four weeks of treatment and received a total of 42 weeks of, of therapy. The study took two years to plan. We started it in December 26, 2006 and completed six years later in December uh, 2012. It took about a year and a half to get the results. And these are the results, which I will say were disappointing. With all that time put into planning, conducting, and waiting for results, we had a statistical dead heat. The two arms, the back arm with historic therapy and the back of the eye arm, had very similar event-free survival and overall survival, despite the, uh, the preclinical data we had saying that arenatecan was very active. Now, uh, we did notice some striking differences in side effects between the two arms, and we knew that there would be a higher risk of diarrhea. This is looking at the, uh, the risk of severe side effects in different treatment periods, the first 15 weeks, the next 15 weeks, and the final 12 weeks. And we could see that diarrhea was more common on the arenatecan arm, and that's expected. The dose-limiting toxicity of arenatecan is diarrhea. We expected that. We also expected to see somewhat more oral mucositis on the vincristine and arenatecan arm. 
And the reason is that arenatecan is a weak radiation sensitizer. About half of the patients on the study had paramenopausal tumors, so they had radiation around their face. And so we would expect there to be oral mucositis, and we might expect that mucositis to be more severe in the arenatecan arm. But what was unexpected was the reduction in hematologic toxicities, particularly in later phases of therapy, seen with the VI arm. That is, children who received arenatecan were less likely to need blood transfusions or platelet transfusions. They were less likely to have febrile neutropenia, et cetera. So based on this reduction in hematologic toxicity, we think that since the two treatment arms have relatively equivalent uh, outcomes, we thought we could pick the arm that has less acute toxicity and recommend that for future therapy, uh, replacing VACs with VACVI. But I still think it's somewhat disappointing that after all the planning that went into the study, we still had two arms that ended up being statistically the same. And so you could ask the question, why is it that our prediction that the addition of arenatecan would improve outcome failed to be the case? Well, I want to take a step back and, and review how it was that we designed studies in the 90s and early 2000s. And they basically started with um, experiments in the laboratory and, and xenografts, so uh, rabbit sarcoma growing in a mouse, where we would test an agent and look for agents that had activity in this mouse um, uh, preclinical model. And if we found an agent that looked interesting, we would do what's called a phase two window. What a phase two window is, is uh, you take a group of children with metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, you give them one or two drugs together, and you assess the response at an early time point after six or 12 weeks. And if a drug looks active, high rate of response, you then take that drug, drug pair into a definitive phase three study. So that was the sequence of how we designed studies, moving from mouse to phase two window to definitive phase three studies. And this table summarizes 20 years of clinical trials where agents that were identified as being active in the mouse model on the far left were then brought into phase two windows and some were identified as being active either alone or in combination with other agents. But every time where we tried to test the combination in a definitive phase three study, it failed. The agent that looked active in a mouse or showed activity in a phase two window failed to predict a winning arm in a randomized phase three study. So this is just this strategy that we pursued for 20 years failed to have a winning uh, arm when we tested in phase three. So I would suggest that that was not the right way to identify agents to test for our large phase three studies. So what could we do instead? Well, another strategy uh, is to pursue selection or screening studies. And this involves randomized studies. All of what I showed you on the last slide were non-randomized single arm studies. So this tests ran the random addition of agents either alone or in into a backbone. And the idea in this randomized design is that you are, by comparing one arm to the other, you're looking for evidence that you should conduct a randomized phase three study, which is much larger. And by design, you pick an early endpoint response rate or early event-free survival. And you also pick less stringent statistical rules because you want to do as many studies as possible. You're not looking for definitive statistical evidence of superiority. You're just looking for a signal that you should conduct a large phase three study. And um, if we do this, um, we can design studies that are shorter. They don't require as many patients. We can do more studies because we have we don't require as many patients, so we can uh, test more agents in this in this strategy. And the hypothesis, which I will admit still is a hypothesis, is that if we pick a win if a winner is identified with a screening or selection study, it has a higher chance of being successful in phase phase three because it was a winner in this or selection design. So here's an example of how we're, we think we may um, have a chance to test this hypothesis. And this was a study conducted by COG in children with recurrent rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. It was a randomized phase two selection design. It was open to children with first recurrence or progression. And everyone on this study got the same chemotherapy backbone. And details are not important, but involved two drugs, venerelbin and IV cyclophosphamide. They were randomized to get one of two biologic agents, bevacizumab, which is a bad JEF inhibitor, and temsirolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor. At the time, those were two of the more exciting agents, uh, biologically targeted agents available. And this shows you the design of that study. Again, first recurrence of rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma, everybody gets venerelbin and cyclophosphamide, and one arm gets bevacizumab, one arm gets temsirolimus, and the primary endpoint is event-free survival in these children. This, so the study was opened up and closed um, after uh, three years because 
we clearly had a winner. And the winner was the, the, the tensor alignment arm. When we looked um, at event free survival, the children who got vinoglobulin cyclophosphamide with tensor alignment had an improved event free survival. They also had a modestly improved uh, response rate. But this was not definitive evidence that tensor alignment would improve evidence, uh, outcome because we didn't design the study that way. But it was a signal that if we wanted to pick an agent to bring forward into a randomized phase three study, Tempsorolimus would be the drug that we would prioritize for future study. And that's exactly what's happening right now in the children's oncology group. There's an open intermediate risk rhabdomyosarcoma study where at diagnosis children are randomized to either get the standard back of the eye chemotherapy or back with the addition of weekly Tempsorolimus. Radiation is now delayed to week 13. The duration of therapy is still the same, 42 uh, weeks or 14 courses with this modest cyclophosphamide exposure. So this study uh, activated in uh, 2016 and uh, had a brief suspension and that reopened in, in 2018. Now, at the same time this study was being conducted, we got some very interesting results from Europe. And uh, this is a, is a busy slide. In Europe, uh, the EPSSG was conducting a study where they looked at the value of doxorubicin. That turned out not to be a value. That's the left part of the design. But in children with localized disease, but at higher risk for recurrence, at the end of 27 weeks of therapy, they were randomized to either stop treatment, which was standard, or to continue with low intensity maintenance chemotherapy with vinorelvin and oral cyclophosphamide. And this is what that uh, maintenance regimen looked like. It was uh, every three weeks with a week off of IV venerelbine and then low dose oral continuous uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, this was uh, picked as a regimen that could be tolerated uh, uh, for a long period of time, in this case, six months, with the hypothesis that this protracted maintenance would improve outcome. And that's exactly what was observed. And this is what we learned from the EPSSG is that in this of patients who had a complete response after initial 27 weeks of therapy. They either received 24 weeks or did not receive any more additional therapy and maintenance. And this shows you the event-free survival, which um, barely missed the conventional definition of significance. But overall, survival was clearly superior in the children who received maintenance compared to those who did not. So knowing now that this, uh, these results were available, we, we had to make some decisions within COG. But I want to make a pause here. This is really quite a remarkable finding to see this improvement in outcome. And the reason it was remarkable is that prior to this study, there had only been one study conducted in children with rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and their initial therapy where one randomized arm was superior to another randomized arm. And this was a study that was conducted in the late 60s and early 70s. And it was pretty simple. Um, it took children who had completely resected rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. They all were treated with radiation therapy and they were randomly assigned to get no chemotherapy or a year of low intensity vincristine actinomycin. And these are the results. And uh, for those of you who've looked at these slides, you can see that this is like a hand generated Kaplan Meier curve. This is before PowerPoint or, or, um, or Photoshop. Uh, but you can see that the uh, children who got the adjuvant keep one year of therapy had a better outcome. This is a very small study, just uh, just you know less than 40 patients. But because the results were so clear, we could draw conclusions that giving chemotherapy improved outcome. And prior to the EPSSG study, this was the only study showing a benefit in a randomized design in the frontline treatment of children with rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So you could ask the question, why did this EPSSG maintenance work? And I think there's four hypotheses, and I'll go through them each individually uh, about why um, maintenance improved the outcome. The first is that there was something about this low-dose oral cyclophosphamide that improved the outcome. But I, I do want to note that low-dose cyclophosphamide was not a new idea. It actually was tested on one of those early IRS uh, studies where previously the standard was to give um, oral cyclophosphamide for up to two years. On IRS 2 and beyond, this was switched to IV cyclophosphamide. Uh, and, and yet we didn't see any improvement in outcome between, uh, or decrement in outcome when we went from IRS 1 with oral cyclophosphamide to IRS 2 and 3 with no oral cyclophosphamide. And furthermore, there were two randomized studies in children with either group uh, 2 or group um, 1 disease where they tested oral cyclophosphamide in addition to BA, and there was no improvement in outcome. So I think it's unlikely that it was the oral cyclophosphamide itself that improved the outcome. The next possibility is it was the vinorelbine. And you know, vinorelbine as a single agent actually has a high level of activity in recurrent refractory rhabdomyosarcoma. <clears throat> Two small studies have been conducted. One in Europe showed a 50% response rate. 
when <clears throat> within the children's oncology group showing a 36% response rate. And uh, yet, despite this high level of activity, uh, venerobine was never incorporated into the frontline therapy of rapamycin coma uh, until the EPSSG study. And yet in the EPSSG study, they gave many doses, 18 doses of venerobine. So maybe it was the venerobine that improved the outcome. The next possibility is it was something about the combination of the two, cyclophosphamide and venerobine. And I, I don't know if that's true. There was no preclinical evidence suggesting that that combination somehow was more effective than either agent alone. Uh, there are some theoretical arguments that the two together could have either antiangiogenic activity, or the two together could uh, uh, induce immune modulation that would favor um, uh, immune activity. Um, but there was one study looking at the combination of uh, venerobine cyclophosphamide in children with recurrent disease. And what's important to note is this response rate of the combination was very similar to the response rate seen with single agent venerobine. So again, it's quite possible that it was just the venerobine that made the difference. The last possibility is it was something about the duration of therapy that led to the improvement. And to illustrate this, I just want to show you that uh, prior to this study, the EPSSG standard therapy lasted for 27 weeks. When they added maintenance, they now had a therapy that lasted for a little more than a year or approximately a year, 52 weeks. But that was about as long as the standard COG duration of therapy. Historically, COG studies uh, have given longer duration of therapy than EPSSG. So maybe this was just a duration of therapy issue. If you just gave any type of therapy for longer, you'd see an improvement. So um, COG was now faced with these this problem that we had these published or these released results that showed a benefit of maintenance in children with initially treated rapamycin sarcoma. And what we decided to do was to incorporate this finding without confirming it within the COG. So we amended our study to add maintenance to all patients. So all both arms got oral uh, cyclophosphamide and venerelby. Now the duration of therapy is longer. It's uh, 60, uh, six weeks. And now the the cumulative cyclophosphamide dose has gone up, but still not as high as historic. And the study has now been reopened and probably will reach its accrual goal by the end of this year. So we will know sometime soon whether the addition of Temsorolime has improved outcome, and we'll be able to make a historic comparison to prior to adding the maintenance therapy to see whether that improved outcome compared to historic data. And now I want to switch to the group of patients for which we've had the hardest time improving outcome, and that's children with high-risk disease. That's about 15% of patients, and those are patients who present with distant metastases. Now, uh, COG has conducted a series of studies. I'm going to show you the most recent study that was conducted um, uh, that started in, at the end in, in early 2010. And this study took a very intensive backbone and added one of two interventions, either an insulin-like growth factor receptor uh, antibody um, uh, or uh, a temozolomide. And this was done in a series of pilots where we toggled back and forth. It wasn't a randomized study, but we treated children at one dose level with the IGF-1 antibody, suspended the study, treated them another group with tem uh, temozolomide, suspended the study, went back to a higher dose of the IGF uh, antibody and back and forth. Again, not a randomized study, but we were able to um, uh, enroll a large number of children treated with one of these two um, uh, therapies. Now, we used a backbone that was very intensive, and the details are not important, but it was based on the prior high-risk study where this is kind of a kitchen sink approach where we used as uh, many active agents as possible. And children, again, either received the antibody, that's the AB um, in the lower um, part of the diagram here, or they received uh, a temozolomide um, if, with reticant if that was the intervention. And uh, these results have been recently published, and we saw that the uh, IGF antibody was marginally better than the tem temozolomide arm. And remember, this was not a randomized comparison, so it's a little hazardous to compare the two arms. But both arms were very similar to our historical results. So despite using this very intensive backbone and despite adding a biologically targeted agent like temozolomide or a active uh, chemotherapy agent like uh, or the biologically targeted agent, the IGF-1 antibody or the uh, uh, chemotherapy that was active, temozolomide, we really hadn't improved the outcome compared to historic data. So that's uh, where we, we stood with uh, at the end of, uh, of that time. And what we wanted to do is to see whether we could still lead to some, uh, uh, improve the outcome for patients with high-risk disease. And what we've decided to do is to build on this experience with maintenance chemotherapy and ask whether bringing venerelbing into the initial therapy could improve the outcome for children with metastatic rapamycin sarcoma. 
So this is the study design that um, will likely activate next month in the children's oncology group. Children with high-risk rapamycosarcoma will be randomized up front, either the standard VAC chemotherapy or venerelbing VAC. And uh, for this, we substitute two doses of venerelbing for two doses of vincristine every course. And so every week of therapy, children are receiving one type of vinyl alcohol, either two doses of venerelbing um, per course or one dose of vincristine. And this is a very vinca alkaloid intensive regimen, but we think that this is the best way to evaluate whether the addition, the early addition of venerelbing will improve outcome. And all children in this study will receive the venerelbing oral cyclophosphamide maintenance. As I mentioned, the study will activate in the children's oncology group next month. So now I want to, uh, before I close, I want to talk a little bit about the potential for molecularly targeted therapy in rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is an area of great uh, interest to try to refine our treatment. So instead of just getting set of toxic drugs that are, have non-specific activity in, uh, in uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, could we, by understanding the underlying genomics of rhabdomyosarcoma, could we tailor the therapy or, uh, or develop specific agents that might be active based on understanding the genomics. And prior to the ability to do next generation sequencing at, at a cost that is, um, that's uh, affordable and uh, on a scale that's achievable, this really wasn't possible. But we were able to collaborate with the NCI in a very large um, sequencing effort that involved over 140 children with rhabdomyosarcoma to define the genomic landscape in an unbiased way of rhabdomyosarcoma. And so this is a table from uh, the primary publication of that effort. And in this table, each column is an individual tumor uh, from an individual child. Uh, on the left are tumors that are FOXA1 fusion positive, and on the right are tumors that are FOXA1 fusion negative. And the, each row is a different gene. And you can't see each gene, but I can walk you through the overall findings. You'll notice that in the, um, on the far left, the tumors that are FOX1 fusion positive, there are relatively few genetic events. The genetic event is marked by a, 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 by a square that has a color, has red or, or black boxes. So there's relatively, other than the fusion, there are relatively other gen, few genetic events in these FOX1 fusion positive, the PAX3 or PAX7 fusion positive tumors. On the right are the fusion negative tumors, and you'll see there are more genetic events. And most of the genetic events are um, in uh, uh, RAS pathway alterations. But compared to adult cancers, there's still relatively few genetic events. But I'm going to show you these genetic events in a little bit more detail. This is a table from that same um, paper. And we can, just to summarize again, the fusion positive tumors had relatively few cooperating secondary genomic events. Um, very few uh, uh, compared to other, uh, other tumors. And so, other than having the fusion, we didn't identify other potentially targetable alterations. Compare that to the fusion negative tumors where there was a somewhat higher frequency, but most of the alterations were in, in um, genes or pathways for which we don't have really great treatment options. They are in general RAS pathway alterations, so NRAS, KRAS, HRAS, uh, TP53. Um, these are pathways for which they're individually present at a low number, but if you add up all the the RAS pathway alterations, it's about 45% of, the, of these of these tumors. But many of them, there's not obvious drugs that we would use to try to target those pathways. So we defined the landscape, but what we found was there weren't that many opportunities to target uh, specific drugs based on the alterations. And to some extent, this has been a recurring theme in pediatric cancer that our tumors have relatively few alterations. They're relatively genetically quiet. And this is a, a uh, an analysis from several years ago looking at, on a log scale, the number of somatic alterations in a tumor, um, comparing p uh, different tumor types. And the pediatric tumors are clustered to the left, and the adult tumors, the common carcinomas, melanoma, and so on, are on the right. And again, this is a log scale. So you'll see that the, there are log fold more alterations present in adult malignancies. And if there are more alterations, there are more potentially targetable alterations. And in general, immunothera many immunotherapies, uh, checkpoint immunotherapies are more active in tumors that have more alterations. Um, this does tell us that there are good, that the pediatric tumors are more simple. And they actually may be more difficult to target, particularly with immune-based therapies. And uh, in this analysis, they did include rapid sarcoma, but I superimposed 
the same data about the numbers of alterations that we're seeing in rhabdomyosarcoma. And, and you'll see that rhabdo is at the far end amongst the most genetically quiet of tumors seen in, in malignancy in general, but also amongst pediatric malignancies. So we still wanted to see whether we can make improvements on this. And when we remember that this analysis was based on only about 147 um, tumor samples that had to be selected based on samples for which we had frozen tissue, because that's the reality of how we could do um, next generation sequencing at the time. But the, the real reality is that most uh, of our samples don't, aren't saved frozen. They're saved in formalin. And most of them are the most, the, the, the tissue we have available are just unstained slides. So uh, um, a, a, a formalin thick paraffin embedded a block has been, has been cut and that a slide from that cut has been placed onto a, a, to a, a slide, glass slide. And that's what we have stored uh, available to do research. And, and this is like the least, useful material, but it's what we had available in our biobank. So we need to develop a strategy where we can use the most inconvenient of material, unstained slides, tumor on an unstained slide, um, to do an analysis. So we developed a methodology where we would um, <clears throat> randomly select samples at our bank that we, for which we had formalin fixed material, most of them unstained slides, send them to, a, to a, an investigator, and they would literally scrape the tumor tissue off this script last slide, extract nucleic acids. We did, there's an RNA analysis, which I won't talk about, but also a DNA analysis where we did a, a targeted sequencing panel. But we had to start with the, the most inconvenient, most least helpful material, because that's what was available. And that's what we could use to get a large sample of cases. And so we did this with over 300 cases from COG. We also collaborated with some investigators um, the United Kingdom, got another 300 cases from them, and put together over 600 cases of rhabdomyosarcoma for which we were able to do this targeted sequencing panel. And what we learned was that there were specific alterations that were associated with outcome. We had a large enough patients, group of patients, that we could finally do analyses to see whether a molecular alteration would predict outcome, and that might help us with risk stratification. So they give you two examples of these alterations that clearly were associated with outcome. The first is a mutation in the MyoD1 gene. Um, this tends to result in a very characteristic phenotype of uh, histologic phenotype of a spinal cell sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma. They tend to occur in the head and neck. They tend to be more common in adolescents and young adults. And in low risk children with low risk uh, features, they are present at a low percentage, about two percent, but they have a strikingly poor outcome. And this is the overall analysis comparing children in our whole data set who either have um, no mutation in MyoD1, that's the black line at the top, or they have a mutation in the MyoD1 uh, gene, this uh, characteristic single uh, point mutation. And this is a very strikingly different outcome um, just by, by based on one molecular feature. <clears throat> and when we stratified the outcome by risk group, you could see that the low risk patients who had no mutation in MyoD1 had a significantly better outcome than the low risk patients who had a MyoD1 mutation. <clears throat> so that seems to be a high a predictor of, of outcome. We also identified the uh, TP53, one of the most commonly mutated genes in, in human malignancies, but we had never really looked at it in great detail in rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, this tends to be associated with anaplastic histology. It, it can be seen in any primary site, but is somewhat enriched in the extremity. And among low-risk patients, about 11% of low-risk patients carry this TP53 mutation, somatic mutation. And we found that it was independently associated with the outcome. So this is the same sort of analysis as I showed you before. Again, all patients, all risk groups, black is TP53 wild type, and red line is the mutant uh, patients with a somatic mutation. And you can see that there's a less dramatic difference in outcome than MyoD1, but a difference in outcome. And when we stratify it by risk groups, the patients who have low risk rhabdomyosarcoma, but are TP53 wild type, have a better outcome than those who are low risk, but have a TP53 mutation. So taking these data, we're now proposing a study, which we hope to activate next year in the children's oncology group, where we're gonna try to pull out the bad actors from the low risk arms and see whether we can have even better outcome and maybe even reduce therapy if we take out the rare um, the patients who have these unfavorable molecular alterations. So here's the strategy. We're going to have two arms, one for very low risk patients. This is patients have a completely resected tumor at a favorable site. For, for the most part, this is paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma. These patients will enroll. They'll start with VA therapy 
within six weeks, we're going to do centralized testing of their tumor and return results back to the institution and tell them if that tumor has a MyD1 mutation or a TP3 mutation. If they do, we're going to take them off and do different therapy. But if they don't, they're going to remain on this very low intensity therapy, short duration, and no alkylator exposure. The best hope to avoid infertility from alkylators is to give no alkylators. And so this, we hope, we think that this is a group of patients that we can reduce the therapy to an absolute bare minimum and uh, maintain very good outcome because we'll take out the bad actors, those with myd one mutations or TP53 mutations. This, arm, this study will have a second arm. This is for other patients with low risk disease. Again, this is uh, patients with favorable site tumors. Um, that predominantly, these are orbital and some paratisicular uh, tumors that have uh, lymph node metastases. These patients will be enrolled on therapy based on their uh, clinical features. They'll start with VAC treatment, and within six weeks, we'll return results to the institution about the MyoD1 status and the TP53 status. If the tumor has either of those alterations, they'll be taken off and they'll be assigned to a more intensive treatment, but instead, otherwise, they'll continue on with this low intensity therapy. And our hypothesis is by taking out the bad actors, this very low intensity therapy will be successful in maintaining very good outcome. So that's a strategy that we're that we have approved to proceed with. And again, we hope to uh, activate this study in the Children's Oncology Group uh, sometime in 2022. So I've just given you kind of a whirlwind uh, through what has happened within the Children's Oncology Group, uh, mostly during my tenure as the, the chair of the committee uh, of the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee. Um, I, uh, when I took over as the group chair uh, in March 2020, I turned over the uh, the leadership of the SDS committee to Raj Van Kantramani, who's been doing just a fantastic job of leading the committee. And I always felt a little bit sheepish about presenting any data um, on behalf of the committee because it's not my data. This, these are these studies are the result of work of, of uh, dozens of people on the leadership team within the, the STS committee and hundreds of uh, and thousands, hundreds of physicians all around the country and thousands of nurses and pharmacists who actually deliver the care to children all around the world. This is um, the, these uh, trials require the interdisciplinary collaboration of oncologists and surgeons and radiation oncologists, and pathologists and, and radiologists. We also have collaborators in epidemiology and biology help guide our correlative studies. And we couldn't do this without the input of our statisticians who help us design wise uh, therapies. So I want to uh, thank everyone from the STS committee and from the, the whole COG team for allowing uh, these sort of studies to move forward. And I also want to thank uh, Raj, uh, Dr. Raj again for the kind um, invitation to speak here in Louisville and for your attention. And I think we have some time for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. That was an outstanding presentation. So as Dr. Hawkins mentioned, um, please feel free to uh, either ask questions um, by unmuting or please uh, place them in the chat box. So Dr. Hawkins, while we are uh, waiting for uh, people to ask questions, I just want to say we as pediatric oncologists are one of the most optimistic group of people who have always been wanting to do better and being inspired by the children and families that we take care of. Uh, you know, as I uh, watched your presentations yesterday and today, it dawned on me that it, uh, it was only 70 years ago when a child with cancer hardly received any treatment and uh, because cancer was felt to be fatal then and how far we have come. And, um, you know, um, you have given two amazing lectures that have kindled our enthusiasm and really reinforced our belief that these are great times for pediatric cancer research. So thank you, Dr. Hawkins. It was so wonderful that, and we're very grateful that you accepted our offer to come here today and uh, talk to all of us. Thank you. Now, well, it's a very kind invitation. I, I often reflect um, on the history of, of pediatric oncology. My, my father's a retired pediatrician and he graduated in 1960. Um, and in 1960, we didn't have effective therapies for most children with cancer. And when he was a resident, um, most children with leukemia would survive for a few weeks or a few months, rarely for a year. And now that with the most common types of leukemia, we expect to cure 90% of children. So in his career, he's you know not as a 
pediatric oncologist, but in his time in medicine, he saw that field transformed. And I think it's true for other malignancies too. I think the real pioneers are the people who are willing to do brave things and the parents and families who are willing to do brave things when we didn't have effective therapy, but they, their willingness to work together to take risk led to the chance for cure. And it's the legacy for us who practice pediatric oncology today to continue to improve on that outcome, to take what we've achieved and say, can we do better? Can we increase the cure rates even further? Can we reduce the burden of care, both in short-term and long-term side effects? That's the that's the legacy that we have, but it's because of those pioneers that um, that we at least have the chance to ask to be able to do this. So there's uh, one question from Dr. Knapp. Fascinating to hear about the ways various investigators and groups are working together and learning from each other's data. I'm curious to hear more about potential barriers to international collaboration and also ways to make this successful. Yeah. So thank you for the question. I um, <laughs> that probably is about an hour. I could talk, talk for an hour about international collaboration. The um, you know the barriers are are significant, and they're both personal and they're regulatory. The personal issue is really uh, it's about trust and about um, you know setting up this international data sharing consortium that I mentioned um, called Instruct started with um, meeting with stakeholders and reassuring them that we were going to pool data, but it was going to be all of our data and that we were going to share it and we we're going to manage it together. That it wasn't, it wasn't me asking them to send um, me their data. And so first starting by building on trust was really important. And fortunately within pediatric oncology, there's a long tradition of trust that goes across international barriers. And um, so that I think we have, we at least have the foundation to do that. Um, <clears throat> there's a very active effort led by uh, Sam Baltimore and uh, University of Chicago to build to, to um, organize multiple data sharing consortia across different histologies. And I talked about rat, uh, soft tissue sarcoma one, but there are other efforts uh, that have already existed in neuroblastoma and uh, have begun in germ cell tumors and um, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, um, uh, AML, ALL. And so I think there's an infrastructure if you have trust, you can do that. The regulatory barriers, I think, are probably more significant when we're talking about clinical trials, where we're trying to do an intervention clinical trial, because um, it, it's not easy to run a clinical trial um, across international boundaries uh, due to regulatory reasons, different rules about how those studies are conducted. You know, COG is fortunate that we're an international organization, but even within COG, sometimes it's hard to get drug distribution uh, outside of the United States. Um, and it's even harder when we're collaborating with investigators outside of COG, but it's possible. You oftentimes need to uh, engage a pharmaceutical partner um, because that's uh, they can manage drug distribution and data collection internationally. But um, th these issues of how we how we run clinical trials across a multiple cooperative, uh, multiple uh, countries uh, outside of COG are a major issue. But it's something we have to face because the um, um, the, uh, Dr. Raj asked me this question last night. You know, we are starting to see more finely defined, um, uh, molecularly defined cohorts of patients that get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, how will we study these rare subtypes? Um, uh, and 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 perhaps the only way to do that is to is to be able to run international studies where we can treat a rare molecularly defined group of patients in COG as well as European countries, as well as uh, Asian countries. And that may be the only way to get enough patients to answer questions. So uh, there are some significant regulatory barriers. I think the uh, FDA and the EMA are both invested in, in helping us um, overcome those barriers uh, because they realize that that's the path uh, to conduct uh, studies in, in rare uh, cancers, including most pediatric cancers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Anybody? Uh, yeah, I think that was just a, a wonderful tour through the, the progress that y'all have made in treating this disease. But I got latched on to uh, one thing that you said to just pique my interest with the IGF-1 uh, antibody. Uh, have people used uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, along the same fashion to block the activity there? 
Right. So there, I mean, there's there's a number of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and most of the ones that are were in early use were relatively dirty, you know, pan uh, multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and the ones that have had single agent testing um, have had disappointing activity in rapid sarcoma. There still is the interest in, in looking at combinations, and there's a trial at the NCI of a of a different IGF-1 antibody, gonitumab, with um, uh, the satinib. Uh, and there's preclinical data saying that a combination would be uh, uh, effective. But as single agents, the TKIs have been disappointing. That's still, the, the, as a general statement, um, I think there still is some interest about combination studies. And in Europe, there's a the desire to study regorafenib, a, a pan TKI inhibitor, in combination with chemotherapy. And in other sarcomas, including rapidomyos, including osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and in other soft tissue sarcomas, there is interest in um, and some evidence of activity of some of the, uh, the multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But for rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, certainly as single agents, they, they have been disappointing. And how to combine them effectively remains remains a question. Thanks. Great question. Thank you, Dr. Schickler. So, anybody else? If not, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hawkins. This was outstanding. We're so grateful for this. It was the first time the Children's Oncology Group Chair has ever visited Louisville. And so thank you so much from all of us. And uh, you know, wish you a safe travel back to Seattle and uh, looking forward to the next COG meeting. Yes, and in person at some point, right? At some thank point, you. yes. OK, yes. thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Okay.